Order, order. We now come to the debate on Welsh affairs. And I call Stephen Crabb to move. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's good to see you back in this chair for the annual debate on Welsh affairs. Uh, we call it the St David's Day debate. Um, this year, of course, it's just pre-St David's Day. Um, I wish all the members a very happy St David's Day for tomorrow. Dydd Goyle, Dowie Happers. But if I could start my remarks with a slightly discordant note, because I think it is a bit disappointing, Mr Deputy Speaker, that yet again the debate on Welsh affairs, the annual St David's Day debate, is being squeezed in the timetable. Now, there have been two very important debates scheduled for this afternoon, and anybody who was in here for the, last, the previous debate would have heard the very serious remarks and speeches being put forward. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, could I perhaps ask you, during the course of the debate, if you could give us some guidance on how we can get back to a situation where we do protect the time for Welsh members to have their one day a year to be able to raise matters of importance to their constituents, because there is a feeling amongst many of us that the, how can I say, the smaller nations of the United Kingdom are not being well served in this institution at the moment. Putting that aside, it is good to have this debate again, Mr Deputy Speaker, and as the Member of Parliament for Priscilla Pembrokeshire, I am extremely honoured to represent the city of St David. Now, we have argued before during these debates about whether David himself was born in Ceredigion or in Pembrokeshire. The important point for us, though, for those of us from Pembrokeshire, is that the, uh, this sixth-century monk who founded the bishopric has huge importance for us culturally and, and socially and, and economically in, in the way that St David's, as a city, continues to attract visitors from all over the country and, indeed, all over the world. Now, a few weeks ago, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was, uh, was honoured to attend the cathedral for the enthronement ceremony of the 130th Bishop of St David's, Bishop Dorian, who uh, represents just the latest in a continuous line of bishops that go all the way back into the mists of the Dark Ages to the time of David himself. And I think that's a remarkable thing that marks our corner of West Wales out as, something very, as somewhere very special indeed. And I'm sure all members from the House in Wales, particularly those who have constituencies within the diocese, will uh, wish Bishop Dorian all the very best. Now, it, it's a massive privilege of me, for me, this Parliament, to have been the Chairman of the Welsh Affairs Select Committee. And given that this will be the last St David's Day debate of this Parliament, I'd like to put on my record, Mr Deputy Speaker, huge thanks to the, my fellow members of the committee, who uh, are a joy to work with. I learn so much from them, and I want to thank them for the hard work that they've put in to the committee's work over the last four years. And of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd also like to thank the clerk of the committee, Alison Groves, and the previous clerks that we've had, starting with Adam Evans, uh, um, Anwen Rees, and Sarah Yonu, all of whom are uh, incredibly intelligent, incredibly diligent, and made my job as chairman so much easier. Now, I was conscious when I became chairman of the committee that I was following in massive footsteps. Um, the, 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 the shoes, uh, no less, of the current Secretary of State for Wales, who was both an outstanding chair of the Welsh Affairs Committee, but also a very popular chair of, of the Welsh Affairs Committee. So I, had, I knew I had big shoes to fill. But I started off with three objectives, which I outlined to the clerks team at the start when I became chair. And it was really to see whether, as a committee, we could uh, be, show relevance, whether we could be more visible, improve our visibility, and through doing that, improve our impact as a committee and our impact on, uh, on government decisions, but more broadly on national life in Wales. And the way I think we've gone about our work as a committee over the last four years, I think we've tried to stay true to that. I think, it's, although these things are difficult to measure, I think uh, we, we feel that we've put a lot of worthwhile effort into the committee and we've had some good fruit from many of the inquiries that we've been investigating. We've uh, looked at some very big picture issues, for example, the future of broadcasting in Wales at a time of uh, enormous change in the global broadcasting industry, looking at the particular risks to Welsh public service broadcasters, who are, of course, the very bedrock of Welsh broadcasting success, and particularly uh, the, the, the role of Welsh language broadcasting 
uh, in our national life, and we hope the, the government continue to take note of the recommendations that we made on that subject. We've also looked at some very specific issues, sometimes quite technical, like grid capacity in Wales, which was, as I say, a, a technical issue for us to grapple with, but actually one of such importance in terms of unlocking all of the opportunities and potential for renewable energy in Wales and making sure that our constituents see the benefit of the energy revolution through things like the rolling out of, um, of electric vehicles and charging points. We've also tried to be very reactive as and when new information and new data has come to light on an issue of public importance. We've tried to, to respond very quickly and I would say that water quality, the, the scandal of sewage pollution in Wales is one e issue which we have focused on, not holding not just one but two sessions with the bosses of the water companies in Wales, Natural Resources Wales and Ofwat. And the reason that we held the second session, of course, A, because we weren't satisfied with some of the answers that we were getting from the first session, and B, because of new information coming to light which appeared to suggest that Welsh Water knew that it was pumping illegally uh, large volumes of sewage into waters in Wales. And what, one of my priorities uh, in leading the committee, Mr Deputy Chairman, as uh, Deputy Speaker, has been to try to get the committee out and about in Wales. And I think it's about some of the most meaningful meetings we've had as a committee have been with people not on the estate or necessarily in front of our committee upstairs in the committee room, but actually in Wales. And I think about, for example, meeting with A-level students at Gower College, talking to them about their aspirations, talking to them about how they consume media, and particularly the role of social media in their lives, and the fact that so little of what they consume through these new digital channels has any Welsh-specific content, and what the implications might that, uh, that, that, that might have for the future. I think about the meeting... I will give way. Purely for the record, and as a fellow of Gower College, Swansea, can I ask that the Honourable Gentleman include the full title for Hansard? The full title? Swansea. Swansea. The Honourable Lady has made her, her, her point uh, with, with her usual force and eloquence. Um, I think as well about the meeting that we had with apprentices at the magnificent Airbus factory in Broughton. And if anybody is in any doubt, I, I would argue with them that the Airbus apprenticeship scheme has to be the most impressive, probably the most competitively uh, applied for apprenticeship anywhere in the country. It was really, really impressive what we saw there. But I also think about the meeting that we had a few weeks ago, Mr Deputy Speaker, at Her Majesty, uh, His Majesty's Prison in Cardiff, uh, where we spent the morning in Cardiff Prison finishing up with a sit-down session with a group of prisoners who opened up to us in just the most remarkable of ways, talking about their upbringing, talking about their struggles with relationships, with addictions, talking about past failures and mistakes, and talking about their hopes for the future. And what really struck a chord with me, Mr Deputy Speaker, was the way they talked about feeling respected by the staff at the prison and feeling that they could give respect back. And there was hardly a dry eye in the room at the end of that session. It's probably the most powerful and moving thing uh, I've, I've done as a, a Member of Parliament in the last 18 years, and I'll give way. A, a really interesting introduction, and I'm glad that he has mentioned the, the work done by prison staff because their work is so critical. But I'm sure he must agree with me that we have an anomaly in the situation of justice in Wales, whereby so many of the critical support services, when prisoners come out of prison, are run by the Welsh Government. And that situation is not reflected anywhere else in the, in, in, within the England and Wales uh, legal situation, and that that, sooner or later, must come to a close because it is insufficient comes back in with a response. Um, people could start to think I'm going to put an official five minute limit on uh, and I take very much what Mr Crabbe had to say about ensuring that you get a decent amount of time to discuss Welsh affairs in the future. Stephen Crabbe. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. I don't agree with the um, Right Honourable Lady because we, we, we've been taking evidence on exactly this issue and what we've come across are extremely professional people working in those public services, working in the prisons, to make sure that the, if you like, the jagged edge of devolution doesn't create 
disadvantages for Welsh prisoners, but that will be something that we continue to look at during the course of this current inquiry. Then just moving on um, briskly, if I can, Mr Deputy Speaker, I've been very, very encouraged by the engagement that we've had with UK ministers, and I want to thank the Secretary of State and his predecessors for the 10 public evidence sessions that they've had with us over the last four years. But it's also worth noting, Mr Deputy Speaker, we've had the First Minister of Wales in front of us four times. We've had 10 other sessions with other Welsh Government ministers, and I, I believe that this level of engagement with Welsh Government is unprecedented, and it's something that I hope will continue whoever is leading the Welsh Affairs Committee in the next Parliament. Um, we've also been able to question the chief executives of some of the devolved bodies, whether that's Transport for Wales, over deterioration in rail performance in Wales, whether that's the chief executive of Natural Resources Wales around water quality, or, as, as we did yesterday, the Chief Executive of the Development Bank of Wales, which, of course, is responsible to Welsh gov Government. I have also tried to change, Mr Deputy Speaker, the way that we have that we, the membership, the way we work as a, as a team on the committee. Um, so one of the things I have done, Mr Deputy Speaker, is, is exploit the standing order rules, which allow guesting. So I am very pleased that we have had other Welsh members of Parliament who are not permanent members of the Welsh Affairs Committee plugging in and taking part in individual inquiries where they have a specific interest, notably the member for Cardiff West on the broadcasting inquiry uh, and the member for Wrexham when we've been looking at the defence industry in Wales. But more than that, Mr Deputy Speaker, I've also sought to involve the chairs of some of the committees from the Senedd. So I was very pleased that Delith Jewell joined us for the broadcasting inquiry and Clear Gruffith uh, when we were questioning the Chief Executive of Transport for Wales. And the reason I put this on the record is because I think we've got a challenge in the next Parliament. We will have fewer members of Parliament from Wales, significantly fewer members of Parliament from Wales. And I say with great sadness that that will inevitably mean a weaker Welsh voice in this institution, both in absolute terms and in relative terms. Welsh representation is going to be smaller in the next Parliament. And I think in terms of making sure the Welsh Affairs Committee, which I've got a great interest in, can continue to build on the, the work, good work that we've done, I think we're going to have to change the way that that committee works. We know that the Welsh Grand Committee is effectively moribund and nobody is mourning its, uh, its slow death. Um, but the Welsh Affairs Committee has proved its worth. And I would like to see us move to a situation where all Welsh backbenchers have the opportunity to participate in different inquiries depending on their interests and their in availability. And I've written to the Leader of the House and the Chair of the Liaison Committee about that issue. I think there's a lot more work to be done to get progress on that. But I'd like members who do hope to be back here in the next Parliament to bear that in mind as we think about how we make sure that the Welsh representation makes its presence count here at Westminster. And then my final um, note, Mr Deputy Speaker, is about Senev's reform because that's the other side of the democratic coin in Wales. Welsh Government plans to expand the Senedd really quite significantly with 36 additional members. Different figures have been put on the cost of that. My big concern at the moment is about how they intend to elect those members of the Senedd. And I've questioned the First Minister about this, uh, about the fact that there will be multiple members for the same constituency. Uh, the First Minister didn't think it presented such a problem, and he suggested to me that actually one of the strengths of the new system would be that somebody who might want to take an issue to a Conservative member of the Senate could do that, or they could take it to a Plaid Cymru member of the Senate, uh, because that ref might reflect their political preference. Well, that is a fundamental shift from how we go about our business as members of Parliament in our constituency. I don't care whether somebody voted how they voted, whether they put up a sign for me, or, or whether they did everything they could to get me out of office. I will represent that person to the very best of my ability. And this idea of, in the First Minister's language, a plurality of representation in these new supersized constituencies, I just fear that we're going to end up with a, a fuzzier, more diluted sense of democracy in Wales at a time, actually, when both at the Westminster end and in Cardiff, we need Welsh politicians to be much more effective and really showing value to all of our constituents and getting the change that we want to see in Wales, because Wales desperately needs that. I'll bring my remarks to a close there, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I look forward to hearing what other members have to say. Thank you very much for that. Um, the question is, as on the order paper, 
as I said, please try and do about five minutes and then we can get everybody in equally. Tonya and Tony Yassi. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Right Honourable Member for Priscilla Pembrokeshire for securing this debate, and it's one I look forward to every year. Now, even or despite this year, we're here off the back of three defeats so far in the men's Six Nations. Um, the exciting potential, however, of a young squad under the leadership of Warren Gatland is very, very exciting, and my glass continues to be half full. And I'm also looking forward very much to watching the women's Six Nation and seeing them run out on into the Principality pitch. So, um, with that national joy of rugby, uh, had to have a mention. I spoke about rugby in the last two debates, and I'm not going to make you suffer it again. So. I'm going to sing the praises of my wonderful constituency of Gower, and I make no apologies about stating the fact that I represent the most beautiful constituency in Wales. And I know, I know, I know other members may argue for their patches, which only goes to show that we are very, very lucky to call Wales home. The Gower Peninsula, as you all know, is the first designated area of outstanding natural beauty, not just in Wales, but across the whole of the UK. And over the recess, I paid a visit to The View, The View, an aptly named uh, hospitality business, overlooking the remarkable Rossilli Bay, to discuss the issues that hospitality is having in Wales at the moment, and especially VAT. But it, Rossilli Bay is often included on lists of the best beaches in the world, and there's no question for me that it belongs in the company of the likes of Bondi and Venice Beach. But my favourite walk, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the one to Worms Head, only four miles from the car park, but it's an amazing every-terrain type of walk. When you walk to the end, you've got the Coast Watch volunteers, and I'd like to pay tribute to them, and, and Princess Anne paid tribute to them only a few weeks ago in the constituency, because the work that the volunteers do there to keep our visitors and our people safe when they want to walk out to the worm is second to none, and I, I'd just like to, to pay, pay tribute to all of them and their hard work. But there are other parts of the Gower constituency that are renowned for other reasons. Last week I paid a visit to Selwyn Seafoods, who harvest cockles and lava bread collected from Penclough. The cockle industry has been part of the life of Penclough since the Roman period at least, and the cockles are so sourced and sold worldwide. But the history is so important for the Gower families, who have travelled widely to sell their cockles, and it really warms the cockles of your heart, to coin a phrase. <laughs> I'd also like to take a moment or two to recognise the boundary changes that the Honourable Mem Right Honourable Member for Priscilla Pembrokeshire has mentioned, and they will affect me. I'm going to lose uh, my constituency in Cliddock, should I be successful at the next election, and I would like to thank them for their commitment to me and their support. Yeah, yeah. In October last year, I was lucky enough to be at the opening of the restored Cliddock Lock, and I paid tribute to the work of the Canal Trust, and especially Councillor Gordon Walker, who handed me uh, an axe with which to open the lock. I mean, no damage done, no damage done, members will be pleased to know, but it was one of the highlights of my seven years in this place. The Gower constituency may be losing Cliddock, but against Cockett, Dunvant, and the rest of Killay, Males and, and uh, the new award of one Arloyth. So I w thought I might in, you know, put a few fun facts in there. I'll have to cut them short. But the Cockett Ward includes Forest Vark, which used to be the home of not one but two Greyhound racing stadiums. Dunvant and Calais. Dunvant is, the, is most famous as the home of Dunvant Male Voice Choir, the oldest continuously singing choir in Wales, founded in 1895. Males, after campaigning for years, the Males Ward is now home to the Mumbles Skate Park and a fantastic addition to the seafront of Mumbles. And finally, one Arloith, or one eyelid to the locals, is a ward <laughs> that split out of Cockett and I had the pleasure of playing women's rugby there for a little bit and I have got many, many good friends as a result of it. And I had to get rugby in one more time. But I'm going to finish there. It's a testing time in Wales at the moment, with Tata Steel, the jobs and the impact that it has on people in my constituency, and I am always there to support them. It's a testing time as well in agricultural communities 
across Europe, not just in Wales. This is not a singular particular issue. And we have to work together, cross-party and with our farming communities, and encourage all constituents who want to make their voice heard to respond to the consultation with Welsh Government before it closes on March the 7th. I am going to look forward to hearing the rest of today's speeches, and whilst I speak better French and Italian than I do Welsh, I will dust off my famous phrase and I will say, Dith Goyl Dewi Hapis Pau. And I stood for council in Cockett once. Clearly, I did not get elected. But <laughs> <laughs> you are going to enjoy Cockett. <laughs> David Jones. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And may I also congratulate my right honourable friend on securing this debate and also uh, mildly uh, support his criticism of the attenuated nature of this debate today. It's really not acceptable. But last Saturday, uh, I had the great pleasure of uh, hosting my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Leveling Up uh, Housing and Communities, when he visited the town of Rithin in my constituency. Um, Rithin is, and I apologise to the Honourable Lady for Gower, Rithin is ar arguably the finest, most beautiful <laughs> small town in the whole of Wales. Uh, and it's benefiting from uh, a levelling up award of some £11 million. The Secretary of State was uh, very impressed with, with the levelling up proposals for Rithin, uh, and he received a warm welcome. Um, this was in contrast to what happened two days previously, also in my constituency, when the Welsh Government's First Minister decided to uh, cancel uh, a visit to Colwyn Bay, having also had a warm welcome of rather a different nature from farmers uh, in Rill the previous day. Uh, those farmers were protesting about the Welsh Government's sustainable farming scheme, which they consider is detrimental to their interests, and I fully share their view. The Welsh Government's proposals, which are currently the subject of a consultation, as we've heard, would require farmers to set aside 10% of their land to tree planting and another 10% to wildlife habitats in order to qualify for subsidy payments. The Welsh Government say that the aim of the scheme is to secure food production systems, keep farmers farming the land, safeguard the environment and address the urgent call of the climate and nature emergency. Frankly, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's hard to see how reducing the productive land available to each farmer by 20% will either safeguard food production systems or keep farmers farming the land. Uh, it's also <coughs> impossible to see, in all frankness, how any measures put in place by the Welsh Government in almost any context will make any appreciable difference to the climate emergency. The Welsh Government's plans, quite simply, are going to damage agriculture in Wales, and that's not my view alone. That was also the conclusion of the Welsh Government's own impact assessment, which predicted that the policies will result in a 10.8% reduction in Welsh livestock numbers, an 11% cut in labour on Welsh farms, and a 125.3 million hit to output from the sector, and a loss of £199 million to farm business incomes. Given that the Welsh Government's own Im impact as assessment has predicted such dreadful consequences, it is almost impossible to understand why they think it's a good idea, so to speak, to plough on with what is clearly a catastrophic policy. Uh, there's no doubt that climate change is a reality which does need to be addressed, and indeed is being addressed very effectively by the Westminster Government. However, when deciding whether the Welsh Government's proposals are sensible or proportionate, one should take into account the fact that Welsh greenhouse gas emissions are already very low indeed. In 2021, the UK contributed only 0.77% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Of those emissions, Wales was responsible for just 7.5%, and the Welsh agricultural sector was responsible for only 15% of those Welsh emissions. Welsh agricultural greenhouse gas emissions therefore constitute just 0.008866% of the global total. Nigel Lawson famously observed that to govern is to choose. And it's quite clear that the Welsh Government has deliberately chosen to penalise Welsh agriculture 
to damage Welsh farming incomes and to decimate the ranks of those who are employed in the rural economy in order to achieve a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that will, in global terms, be entirely insignificant. Yes, I'll be delighted to give way. Can I suggest, very respectfully, that rather than wind up the rhetoric, that he encourages his constituents to respond to the consultation? There's still a whole week to go. My constituents, I can assure the Honourable Lady, have responded to the consultation, both on paper and physically, because several of them were in Cardiff yesterday objecting to this ludicrous proposal. If large numbers of Welsh farmers are forced off their land, which the Welsh Government's own impact assessment predicts they will be, the consequence will be increased rural depopulation. Welsh culture will be undermined, the Welsh language will be weakened, and it will be another nail in the coffin of the Welsh rural way of life. But that, it would appear, is entirely acceptable to the Welsh Government, provided it results in a pitifully small reduction in emissions. And, of course, it's not just the farming community that's being damaged by the disproportionate pursuit of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Reducing emissions was used to justify the ludicrous 20 miles per hour speed limit that now prevails across built-up areas in Wales, a measure that is so hated that almost 470,000 people have signed a petition calling it for it to be scrapped. And again, the same justification was given for last year's decision to abandon all major road-building projects in Wales, including the desperately needed Third Menai Crossing. When he announced the policy, the Welsh Government's Deputy Minister for Climate Change, yes, they apparently have got a Deputy Minister as well as a Minister, uh, said that none of this is easy. Well, he's quite right in that respect. It's not easy for farmers, it's not easy for commuters, for business people or for families. Livelihoods are being put at risk and lives are being made miserable by a Welsh Government that is putting dogma ahead of common sense. To repeat, to govern is to choose. And the Welsh Government could now, and should, make a new choice. They should recognise that they are the administration for a relatively small, lightly populated part of the United Kingdom, and that they should be serving its specific needs and addressing its priorities in a proportionate manner. Wales needs better health care, better schools, better roads, a better economy, a better quality of life. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, those needs are not well served by the dead hand of climate change fanaticism. Dame Nia Griffiths. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a huge pleasure to speak in this debate, and I congratulate the uh, Right Honourable Member for Priscilla Pembrokeshire for securing it today. And I have to say to my colleague from the Gal that we do have the best views in Wales, and she can't actually (laughs) deny that. (laughs) (laughs) So, so Wales, um, I'll have to confine my remarks to two topics because of time for other colleagues to come in but I'd like to talk first of all about railways Wales accounts for around 11% of the route length of all rail network in England and Wales combined but only has had 1.6% of Mm. rail enhancement spending in the last decade. Now we in South West Wales have a vital railway link from London through to the ports of Pembrokeshire where they meet up with the ferries to provide that link to Ireland but we desperately need investment in this line Firstly, we had the fiasco of the stop-start on the electrification. When Labour left power in 2010, we had plans to electrify the line all the way from London to Swansea. And then the Conservative Lib Dem coalition government cancelled the section from Cardiff to Swansea, then reinstated it after campaigning from MPs only to cancel it again. And the Right Honourable Member for Carmarthen West and South Pembrokeshire, when he was Secretary of State for Wales, stood at that dispatch box and claimed that it was not worth doing because of the nature of the track. It meant that you wouldn't get any significant improvement in speed, so the journey time would not be any shorter. But that, Mr Deputy Speaker, completely misses the point. Electrification of the lines is vital for other reasons. Mm -hmm. Firstly, to tackle climate change. Using electricity from renewable sources means we can make a significant contribution to cutting emissions. Secondly, pollution. Much better to have nice, clean electric trains rather than the diesel fumes that are currently pumped out into our stations and urban areas. Thirdly, noise. If you're somewhere like Central Square in Cardiff, the noise and the pollution coming from the diesel trains in the station is dreadful, certainly not improving our city centre environment. Let me come to the state of the railway. Time and time, uh, colleagues and I find ourselves delayed on our journeys to and from London. And all too often, this seems to be because of basic failure of infrastructure, 
Failure of signalling systems, meaning some lines are blocked, points failure, damage to overhead electrical wires, defective track with delays and cancellations between London, Paddington and Reading. And often we are told that there is just congestion through the Slough and Reading areas. There just simply does not appear to be the capacity to carry the traffic. And yet, this is a major railway line linking South and West Wales to London, providing an international route to Ireland, and yet these problems are constant. It's an embarrassment that people coming to Cardiff, to our capital city, for important events are delayed. And the problem is that it's not an occasional occurrence, but a regular problem. Mm -hmm. I find it easier to count the times that the train is on time than those when it is delayed. <laughs> And if it's not the technical problems, then, as happened only 10 days ago to me, when there is heavy rain, there's flooding around the Swindon area, resulting in a massive detour around Bath, with people packed like sardines on the train. Mm. Now, we're told these storm events are likely to be the norm and not the exception, and so solutions should be found and improvements made. So I would urge the Secretary of State to lobby the Secretary of State for transport for the badly needed improvements for this line. This connectivity is vital. We want people to enjoy coming to Wales, whether, for it's, uh, whether it's for pleasure or business. And then coming further west, yes, we've seen improvements to the Lacker Bridge, but we need real commitment from gov government to invest in and upgrade the railway line all the way through from Netley and Kamal into Pembrokeshire. And we need pressure from government to ensure that Network Rail maintain their assets to the highest of standards, not least to minimise flooding in areas such as along the coast from Llanelli to Carmarthen through Ferry Side. Now, turning to energy, we in the Labour Party are absolutely committed to making Wales and the UK a renewable energy superpower. And indeed, the Welsh Labour government has already facilitated significant investment in wind and a range of marine technologies. We all understand why it's massively needed. Massively needed in order to slash people's electricity bills. Massively needed to power transport of the future and cut our emissions. And massively needed to give us energy security so we're not dependent on foreign despots. And we have such potential for renewable energy in Wales. We've continued to develop wind energy in Wales whilst the Tories banned it in England. But in South West Wales, we have potential not only for onshore wind, but for offshore wind and floating offshore wind. Floating offshore wind can be deployed further out to sea in deeper waters where the wind is stronger and more electricity can be produced. We also have ports such as Milford Haven and Port Talbot, which can be used both in the construction phase and in the maintenance of offshore floating wind. But we face two significant dangers. Firstly, that investors do not come here at all. And secondly, that we do not maximise the opportunities for a local supply chain. As other colleagues and I have previously uh, raised the issue, we had a calamitous result in last year's bidding process when not a single company bid because the government department was either too inept or too stubborn to heed the industry's warnings about the need to adjust the strike price and take account of the surge in inflation. So whilst we didn't have any bidders for floating offshore wind, in contrast, the Irish who worked with the industry had a very successful bidding process. And then the complacency of the energy minister, who effectively just said, and there's next time, i.e. losing a whole year, a whole year when other countries will be stealing a march on us. Now this year I would ask the Secretary of State to work with government colleagues to ensure that we get the very best, that we get the scale of investment that we need in floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea, and that we do need to have a number of different players uh, taking part there. But the UK government needs to be aware of the stiff competition that we face from other countries around the world. The investment in our ports and infrastructure has to be really attractive. Mm -hmm. Business wants a clear direction from government, certainty and incentives. When you look around and see the sort of investment in the United States from the Inflation Reduction Act and similar initiatives across Europe, and then see the way countries like Oman, which have hitherto depended on oil and are invested massively in renewables and clean steel, the UK has to do more to develop a competitive edge. The problem for our ports is that a huge investment has to be made up front before they see any returns. So government ministers do need to be cognisant of that. Then the other great danger is that we do not maximise the supply chain opportunities. We internationally have a strong engineering and manufacturing tradition and the development of offshore wind should open up supply chain opportunities. But for this we need very clear commitment and consistency from government on the size and the time scale of the development of floating offshore wind. We need realistic support the upgrading of our ports. 
and we need a detailed analysis of what are the factors which will help or hinder the development of supply chain industries in Wales and a proper strategy and an understanding of what will make it attractive to develop such supply <coughs> chains in internationally in Port Talbot and the surrounding areas rather than import components from abroad. The tragic irony is that just as we have the tremendous opportunity with the development of offshore wind, we could see the ending of steel production in the blast furnaces in Port Orbit. Mm. Whilst the new electric arc furnace is still not up and running, nor the quality of its product proven for the uses may, we may require. And another essential area of UK government responsibility <coughs> is the upgrading of the national grid system uh, to provide the connections and transmission to get the electricity generated to the areas where it's needed. And I know that's a matter that the Climate Change Minister and Welsh Government, Julie James MS, has been raising. The recent Crown Estates uh, uh, Celtic Sea Blueprint, published this month, gives a lot of detail on what will be needed in terms of the components for offshore floating wind, the port infrastructure required and the shipping needed. The report acknowledges the value of uh, Celsa and Cardiff as UK's primary rebar supplier, but they also refer to other steelmakers, and the worry is that the capacity will not be there. The report also identifies a need to grow port capacity in the region and to use it effectively. So I would like to stress to the Secretary of State that a really joined up effort is needed by government departments, uh, particularly energy and business, to ensure that we really do get the maximum benefits from this fantastic opportunity. Thank yeah. you. To protect everybody's time, I'm going to introduce a formal five minute limit. Virginia Crosby. The Deputy Speaker, I'd like to thank the Backbench Business Com uh, Committee for supporting this important debate and also the excellent uh, <coughs> Chair of the Welsh Fair Select Committee. We've had some fantastic speeches across a broad spectrum. Now, to Annis Morn, some of the oldest churches on my island constituency of Annis Morn are to be found on the coast. Places like Lanalian, St. Sirion, St. Padraig, St. Grinvan, otherwise known as the Church in the Sea by Aberfrau arguably one of the most beautiful spots in Wales. And those early Christian communities settled there because the missionaries which carried the gospel to Annas Morn arrived by sea and built their simple churches where they landed. Much like Dewi Sant, who we celebrate tomorrow, these missionaries left an indelible mark on Annas Morn and the whole of Wales. Many of our place names stem to the age of the saints, the many villages who, whose names begin with clan, clan Vaitli, clan Vathraith, Clan Thaysant, Clan Bedragoch, and so many more give us a clue as to their origin. The ancient Welsh words clan meaning a clearing in the trees where a church was built. Now some 1,500 years of the Christian church's existence in Wales has left its positive mark on language and culture, on history and geography, and on the values of the people. We have Dewi Sant and the many other missionaries of that Celtic age to thank for that. What many do not realise, however, is that we have the Christian faith and a British monarch to thank for the survival of our Welsh language. In 1588, Queen Elizabeth I, who spoke Welsh amongst other languages and was descended from the Tudors of Annas Morn, commanded that the Bible be translated into Welsh. It was that translated Bible that gave us the endearing story of Mary Jones, whose Christian faith was so important that she saved for five years and walked 26 miles just to purchase a Bible in her native tongue. And in the 18th century, it was the same Welsh Bible that clerics like Griffith Jones from Clanthuth Raw used to provide Welsh literacy skills to children and adults alike, long before the state had even contemplated building schools. Thus, the Bible became a key tool to teach literacy as well as religion. The Welsh language is spoken by nearly 60% of the population of Arnas Morn, and for many, it is their first language. It is the language in which most council and public sector meetings are conducted and the language you will hear spoken in the streets and shops of Amloch, Clangevny and Cargobi Holyhead. It's important to me and my constituents that we preserve our language and culture and that's why I use specially commissioned bilingual headed paper to write to my constituents. It's why I have a Welsh website as well as an English one. It's why I produce bilingual newsletters and use excellent local translators, Alan Griffith, Kerry Hughes and the team at Blah Translation in Clangevny when I need to. And although I grew up speaking English because my father had to leave Wales to find work, I'm doing all that I can to promote and preserve the native language of Annas Morn. I continue to learn Welsh and read my oath of allegiance to this house in Welsh. I also support Anglesey Council's applications for UK government funding like the Community Renewal Fund which is used to promote and support the Welsh language on Honest Morn. 
And above all else today, Mr Deputy Speaker, Deep Gil Dewey reminds us of the impact that faith has had on Wales. Much as the wind and the rain has shaped the Welsh landscape, so the Christian Church has shaped the character of the nation and a British Queen preserved its language. Jochen Bell. Ms Savile Roberts. It's an honour to be here again on St David's Day. Deep Gil Dewey, of course and to discuss the separate set of circumstances, issues and problems, and to celebrate what makes Wales unique, even if we only have five minutes to do that on today's occasion. Um, I think you know, that calls for a longer period of time in future would certainly be very welcome. Uh, it's particularly important this week because we're standing on the threshold of the spring budget, and we all have a duty to recognise how what we do here reverberates directly and indirectly in Wales. And we do, as representatives in each, the fairest constituency of Wales, which we all represent, we have a, a duty to both aspire to and to, to seek to bring about what constitutes fairness and ambition for our country. Now, that brings us to the question, of course, of what it is in the gift of the UK government specifically to do to make a real difference. And, of course, what governments can do is to invest in what will make a material difference. And I would propose, of course, that investing in fair consequentials for the funding allocated for HS2 would indeed make a material difference. Not only are we owed around £3.9 billion from this fiasco, but the Prime Minister, in his autumn conference speech last year, promised us the electrification of the North Wales main line route for £1 billion. That, in spite of the fact that this figure is based on a, a 2015 case and that the Welsh Government says that no development work has been done on the project in the intervening nine years, and I imagine that prices have changed. Uh, quite unlike, quite, I might say, like the previous promises that were made of an electrified South Wales main line, on which things also have gone quiet on that front, uh, the Minister of Transport being reluctant to give a timeline. And, of course, we will have heard, because we're in the run-up to an election, of plans to spend HS2 money in the Midlands and the north of England being detailed. A second thing that would make a real material difference to Wales would be to, vault, to devolve the Crown Estate, the asset value of which in Wales was £853 million, and its marine portfolio amounting to £603 million two years ago. In 2020-21, the estate made up made 8.7 million, with 8.6 million from the marine portfolio. This goes directly to Treasury coffers, coffers and 25%, of course, goes to the monarch via the sovereign grant. Imagine what we could achieve in Wales with this money. Devolving the Crown Estate would also give us rights of offshore leasing. It would allow us to have our own green industrial strategy and save bill pairs over £300 million each year through offshore winds, all while generating public funds for the Welsh Government to help better people's lives. We've only got to look to Scotland, where the Crown Estate is devolved, to see what is possible and what is evolving there. We've seen there 20 projects approved through offshore leasing, projected to raise £28.8 billion of investment and passing £700 million to the Scottish Government in public spend. And of course, the other critical thing that again is in the, in the gift of this government is the, the need for so many of our problems that we experience to be solved via fair funding. This requires reviewing and replacing the outdated Barnet formula with a system that delivers equitable funding for all parts of Wales. And there are seven reasons why the formula must be replaced. Firstly, it doesn't address our needs, and it hasn't done so for decades. Wales' funding floor is not based on Wales' current level of assessed need, but rather on estimates made by the Holtham Commission in 2010 that drew on, wait for it, 2001 census data. Secondly, it isn't clear or transparent. When funding announcements are made in England, it may take weeks or months to find out if and how much Barnet consequential funding Wales will receive. Thirdly, we all know the formula is open to political manipulation, with Wales being robbed of at least £3.9 billion through HS2 funding. We recently saw Northern Ireland receive a funding package of £3.3 billion from the UK Government to address its funding problems. If Wales were to receive an equivalent per capita funding package, it would receive £5.4 
$4 billion for Wales. So looking ahead to the spring budget, I would hope that the Government will show somehow or other that they are intending on tackling the deep structural problems that Wales faces, although I'm not going to hold my breath. And to close, for the 14 years Wales has had a, Westminster, a, a, a UK Government which ignores and belittles our needs, wants and values and uses devolution, our democracy and our Senate as a political punch bag. This is bad for our democracy in the UK and Wales and we need to find a better way to deal with the UK as it stands. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I thank my honourable friend, first of all, the right honourable member for Priscilla Pembrokeshire for securing this debate and I echo his remarks on the time available to us. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was born in Bangor and while it's my great privilege to represent in Aberconway part of the area where I was raised, it will be my great privilege to contest the new seat of Bangor Aberconway at the next election. My childhood was also privileged. How else could you describe enjoying North Wales' plunging valleys, scrambling up and occasionally rolling down its rugged mountainsides and learning its heritage, ways and language? I grew up as a result in the firm belief that ours, mine, was a community and culture to be cherished. Although I had yet to put an understanding and reason upon it, I knew intuitively in my bones that people and place mattered. But there was also something else, a feeling or sense shared by so many I grew up with that I would have to leave this home and North Wales to seek opportunities, develop a career and make something of myself. And that was what I determined to change to the best of my ability when I became an MP. Mr Deputy Speaker, there are numbers which give these ideas some shape. The latest 2021 census revealed that Wales' Welsh-born and working-age populations are shrinking. Young people are leaving, the population is ageing. Fluency in Welsh is declining as those raised speaking it find they too must leave. This youth drain is not evenly spread. Data from the real estate site Compare My Move reveals that 72% of those moving home in North Wales leave North Wales, but fully 61% leave Wales altogether. Ours is the highest rate of outward movement of any Welsh region. Analysis by the Higher Education Statistics Agency further reveals that movers are disproportionately educated. For while one in five of Welsh-born people leave Wales, a full third, or one in three, of all Welsh graduates leave Wales. And a recent report by the Wales Governance Centre identified that growth of middle to higher earning roles in Wales has remained stagnant since 2000. The 2023 Bevan Foundation report, Poverty in Arvon in the 21st Century, commissioned by the Honourable Member for Arvon and for which I commend him, reports that 37% of the jobs there are public sector, compared to a UK average of just 18%. Now, this picture of a local economy in North West Wales dominated by agriculture, tourism and hospitality, public sector employment and few well-paid jobs is characterised by hard work and long hours. It is honourable, honest even, but it could not be described as one of growth, opportunity or full of prospects for the next generation. And so how to respond? The Honourable Member for Dwyfo Merionid is correct in identifying investment, but the last major investment in North Wales was the Conway Tunnel nearly four decades ago. And the combination of re revised responsibilities of devolution and a lack of ambition and vision from the Welsh Government in Cardiff have shown little response to these challenges. Their own report in 2016 identified that congestion, poor connectivity and a lack of resilience, uh, with traffic increasing by 2038, represent a threat to locking in the benefits of future proposals associated with the nuclear power station and Anglesey. Just last year, its, report, its own report found that proposed A55 and bridge upgrades could boost investment, but it concluded such schemes would be inconsistent with the Welsh Government's aim to reduce car mileage per person by 10%. It was the same last October on receiving news of the UK Government's investment in the electrification of the North Wales Main Line. The response of the Welsh Government was, it's not a priority for us. But I want to conclude with hope for our young people the clear, real evidence prospect of change coming down the line. The creation of a free port on Anglesey with £26 million of seed funding will ensure investment, skilled jobs and housing can flow into North West Wales. An £80 million investment in an investment zone in Wrexham will leverage £1.7 billion more into high-value advanced manufacturing. 
and the commitment of £1 billion to electrify the North Wales main line carries the potential for faster journey times, at high fr higher frequency of travel, cheaper freights and more freight travel. This bumper investment is a huge step up in our regional competitiveness. Mr Speaker, there is nothing predetermined about decline. We are kindling that ambition that was once there in the 80s, expanding our infrastructure, liberating and connecting our communities and businesses, and securing for our young people a future that combines both prosperity and culture, cultural continuity. The future for our young people in North Wales is brighter. It's because of this Conservative Government, and of that I'm proud. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, deal, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Honourable Member for Priscilla Prems for securing this Welsh Affairs debate today, ahead of St David's Day tomorrow. And like others who have spoken and will speak, I am very proud to be Welsh. Proud of my country, of my family and of the community that I represent, which is steeped in true Welsh values. And I see this every day, people supporting each other and helping their neighbours working collectively to tackle the issues affecting our communities. And for me, this is most evident during the Everyone Deserves campaign that have become an institution, not just in Swansea East, but in communities across Wales during Easter, summer and Christmas school holidays. Everyone Deserves a Christmas 2023 shattered previous records, not just in the number of families that we supported, but the amount of people who answered the call to turn up and help. It's always bittersweet talking about this, as whilst I'm immensely grateful for all the support and proud of what we achieve, it saddens me that demand is so high, that so many families living in our communities are struggling to make ends meet. The cost of living in recent years has crippled households in Swansea and right across Wales. And it's not only families struggling during the school holidays. Last month, we heard the shocking results of a Be Bevan Foundation study on pension and poverty in Wales, which found that one in ten pensioners are skipping meals and one in five going without eating. And indeed, everyone deserves so a rise in the number of pensioners seeking help last Christmas. Now, I'm not going to talk about everyone who helped with the campaign because there are genuinely too many. But I cannot not mention my local heroes who show their support time and time again, and that's the Swans and the Ospreys. Legends on the pitch, although my honourable friend from Gower might disagree with me, and always there unloading vans, packing boxes, and delivering hampers. The wonderful ladies of the Valley's Rock Choir, they are voices of angels and hearts of gold, raising money throughout the year, week in, week out for everyone deserves, and even throw in impromptu concerts while packing hampers to keep everyone entertained. And Pedro Harwood School, whose headmaster I remember being born, which is rather scary, um, who, loaned, who helped launch the Christmas appeal and turned up to do bucket collections at the football, and who are hosting us again this Christmas so we have space to pack the hampers. And my very, very dear friend, Mal Pope, who went one better this year and actually wrote a brand new Christmas song to raise funds for us. I have known Mal literally all my life and I'm so proud of him because he celebrates 50 years in show business this year and I'm so grateful for his unwavering support. There are so many more I could mention because this really is a whole community effort. In fact, it spread way out of my community and last Christmas we stretched to deliver hampers in Swansea East, Swansea West, Sneath, Aberavon, Blaina Gwent, and with my honourable friend, the member for Murder Tidville in Rum Lumley, to his neck of the woods. And I hope one day to be able to say there are less people needing help, that everyone deserves as less referrals, but I fear they, that may be a while off. So until then, it's an honour to provide the support. And whether it's support directly into people's homes, or by funding a play session for Swansea's National Autistic, Autistic Society, or the Hands Up Group for Down Support, or in providing a coffee morning for Swansea City Disabled Supporters Association, who tomorrow, on St David's Day, launch their Everyone Deserves a Kappa sessions. I'm always proud of people's willingness to help each other, especially those who made a little, little more support. We are a nation who wear our hearts on our sleeves. I more than most, probably. <laughs> We do thrive on welcoming people from the hillside to the vales, and they will always be a welcome if you come to our home 
in Wales. Now, dwi'n cym, cari Cymru ac yn enwedig yn caru cwm cynnon lle ces i fy gen i fy magu a oedd ar yn byw. So I'm just saying that I, I, I love Wales like everybody else in this room will. Um, and uh, I particularly love my, my home uh, valley of Cynnon Valley where I was born, raised and, and, and continue to, to live. But our history um, it has been one where plentiful natural resources has generated vast wealth. But sadly, the people of Cymru who created it haven't reaped all the benefits from it. Our wealth has been extracted. The profits to be made, whether from coal or steel, or increasingly from wind and waves, have been siphoned off by a tiny few, while the many who help create and generate it suffer poverty, hardship and inequality. Now, this year we commemorate 40 years since the miners' strike, when a Tory government took on the coal mining industry, decimating local communities in South Wales in the process. Although the heavy industries that define the Cannon Valley have retreated, the extraction continues in different guises, with almost 3,000 jobs under threat at the Tata Steel Works in Portalbet. In Cannon Valley, the wind farms atop our hills are owned by the Swedish state. And the sandstone that makes up the steep valley sides is extracted for profit by a German multinational. This is the story of Cymru's past and present, but it doesn't have to be the story of Cymru's future. In recent years, we've seen an unprecedented recentralisation of power here in Westminster, forcing through legislation that conflicts with the position of Welsh Government and the people of Cymru. And I see that today um, the Senate has voted to withhold legislative consent regarding the anti-boycott bill that was passed here in Westminster. The Independent Commission on the Constitutional Future of Wales final report last month really does mark a landmark moment in Cymru, and it concludes that the status quo is not a viable option for providing stability and prosperity for Wales. And it proposes three options enhancing devolution, a federal structure, and independence. And the Commission's proposals do provide an opportunity for a much needed overhaul of both political and economic power for Cymru. Because the prevailing neoliberal economic orthodoxy is inextricably linked to the current constitutional arrangements. Now, on the economy, there are a number of demands to be made for the UK Government to begin to redress the economic imbalance. It should replace the Barnett formula with a fair needs-based funding system, securing prudential borrowing powers, increasing the borrowing cap and winning an increased reserve for Wales. It should fund the safety of the 2,500 coal tips requiring 600 million remediation work, a legacy of Welsh coal production and ensure that the former mine workers are properly compensated, as demanded by the National Mine Workers' Pension Campaign. It should uphold its post-Brexit promise to Cymru and pay Welsh Government the £1.1 billion owed and give it the reins of power on this. And it should pay Wales the billions of pounds owed in HS2 consequentials. And finally, it should ensure the £850 million revenue from the Crown Estate in Cymru can be used to build a, Welsh sovereign, uh, a sovereign wealth fund. Now, such measures would give Welsh Government greater power to invest in big-ticket initiatives to transform the economy for the long term, whether that be major renewable generation projects or large-scale retrofitting of homes. The Independent Commission's proposals provide the opportunity for a future Cymru where we not only generate wealth, but we retain and reinvest our wealth in our communities for the benefit of all and in a way that tackles the climate crisis. And this new approach, community wealth building coming to Dolly, is gaining traction from Blyneth Asyniog in North Wales to my constituency of Cannon Valley. But to conclude, None of this is possible unless we gain the involvement and confidence of the people of Cymru. And the democratic deficit that currently exists is extremely serious, the disconnection between conventional politics and the people of Wales. 
Democracy isn't just about voting once every five years so that we can sit in Westminster or Cardiff representing or misrepresenting people. It is about giving people a voice, working collaboratively to bring about, for me, a socialist future for the people of Wales. Well, then they... It's a pleasure uh, to contribute to this St David's Day debate, um, although I would add my, uh, my own concerns about the lack of time. I'm very grateful to hear you, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, say that in future we might have uh, longer to discuss all the many important issues that face uh, Wales uh, today. Um, I should also like to congratulate and, and thank the Chair of the Welsh Affairs Select Committee, the Right Honourable Member for Priscilla Pembrokeshire, for securing the debate, uh, and also for the way in which he has chaired the Select Committee. Um, he mentioned in his opening remarks that we have, uh, in recent years, taken quite a broad view of the issues uh, facing uh, Wales and uh, her communities, and um, none more so, perhaps, uh, than uh, the, the changing population of Wales and demographic trends that uh, we've witnessed uh, yeah. not just recently, but uh, over decades. Um, the Honourable Member Faber Conroy touched on this uh, very important point. And, uh, a dynamic, I'm afraid, that uh, affects Ceredigion just as it does uh, his part of, of North Wales, in which um, it has long been the case that young people um, who uh, grow up in Ceredigion uh, leave uh, either for study or for work and seldom come back. And uh, the 2021 census sadly reported that uh, Ceredigion's overall population declined by some 5.8%, um, which is uh, quite a remarkable figure, the uh, largest um, decrease anywhere in Wales. Um, but also within those figures, it told a story of a real change to the demographic makeup um, of Ceredigion. Um, fewer young people, um, children, and young adults, um, and therefore, of course, a higher proportion of the population over 65 years of age. Indeed, Ceredigion has a very remarkable demographic makeup in that it has 13% of its population under the age of 15 um, and 25% over the age of 65. Um, now, this is a problem that I think we should be considering, um, both in Westminster and in Cardiff, because it has real consequences for the ability to deliver public services in an effective, yeah. appropriate manner. Um, but it also has something to do with the ability to ensure that we have vibrant uh, communities. And because I don't want, and I'm not sure, I don't think anybody else would in this room want um, parts of, of Wales, be it in West Wales or elsewhere for that matter, just to become places that, that shut. Um, half the year uh, and only come to life during the summer months. We want a vibrant uh, economy through year where young people can um, expect to pursue exciting careers in the place in which they were born and raised. Um, others have mentioned this afternoon about investment, and I just want to touch on the importance of investing in digital connectivity as part of the solution to develop the economy of rural parts uh, of Wales. Um, it's something that I've raised in, in, in the past in this chamber, Mr Deputy Speaker, because Ceredigion, sadly, doesn't have a very good record when it comes to its digital connectivity. In terms of full gigabit broadband um, and, of course, access to the internet uh, has long become an essential, not a luxury, for, for people in the modern age. Um, access to full gigabit broadband um, in Wales is con uh, constrained to just 37% of households compared with 76% for the UK as a whole, um, and 10.7% 10 10, 10 of households in Ceredigion receive broadband speeds slower than 10 megabits per second. The equivalent UK figure uh, would be 3.6%. So, although progress has been made in recent years, much, much more needs to be done. For not only would it help ensure that people can access essential services, which are increasingly to, uh, going online, uh, but it also could prove uh, a bit of a boost for the local economy. I'm very, very pleased to say that in the few villages and towns where we do have full gigabit uh, broadband, companies are looking to locate and indeed relocate some of their uh, head offices to Ceredigion because they see as long as they have that access to the internet, reliable full gigabit connection, they don't mind uh, that they're in West Wales. In fact, it's an advantage and it can be quite an advantage for us if we're serious about developing uh, the rural economy. Now, in, in the moments that I have left, can I just make a plea with the Secretary of State, because I know he's also keen on rural broadband. Um, Project Gigabit, uh, the UK Government scheme, has um, been in, in, uh, in existence now for a few years, but progress on rural areas is still too slow. 
Um, in Ceredigion, we're still waiting now to understand which um, premises will be connected in the ne next iteration of the scheme. Um, and it will also be the case um, that uh, those who will not be connected will need to find alternative uh, solutions. But the sooner we can have that clarity, the better, because without um, connectivity, their lives are very much diminished in terms of the quality and, and the uh, services that they can access. Um, so if we could have um, greater prominence uh, and priority to the connection of, of rural areas, I'd be very grateful. And, and specifically, perhaps, if you could make a, a suggestion to his colleagues in the Cabinet that for the next round of Project Gigabit, um, that they work outside in so that rural uh, communities are connected first. Here, here. Appropriately, we've got two Joneses to end this debate on the backbench bits. Ruth Jones. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm very pleased to be able to speak in this shortened but perfectly formed debate. And I would like to start by paying tribute to the Chair of the Welsh Affairs Committee, the Right Honourable Member for Priscilla Pems, for securing the debate and to the Backbench Business Committee for granting it. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is my fifth St David's Day as a member, as a member for Parliament for Newport West, and I want to use the few minutes available to me to talk about what is best about Newport West and about Wales. I want to touch on what we need and how my community represents some of our best qualities as a nation in our United Kingdom. I'd also like the chance to send my best wishes to our First Minister, Mark Drakeford, MS, who will be standing down at some point in the coming months. Mark has worked tirelessly for Wales, often at great personal sacrifice to him and his family, and we all continue to mourn the passing of his, his wife, Claire. Yeah. So on behalf of the people of Newport West, we thank him and for his service to our country, his commitment to public service, and we wish him well. Mr Deputy Speaker, as you know, Wales is the land of song, and Newport has long played a role as a beating heart for new and emerging music. The success of Goldie Looking Chain was, of course, an absolute favour of my predecessor, the late Paul Flynn. And, and of course, Wales has more generally seen the prowess of Dame Shirley Bassey, Tom Jones, the Manic, Stereophonics, Feeder, Super Furry Animals. I could go on, but I mustn't forget our honourable friends from Cardiff West and Pontypridd, who have voices that are second to none. But acts and bands and singers cannot thrive unless they have spaces to perform. And in Newport West, I dare say we have one of the best spaces in Wales, which is Le Pub, a welcoming, community-owned, independent music and arts venue. It's a gem in the heart of Newport City Centre, and I want to acknowledge the wonderful, hard-working and inspirational Sam Dab, the brains and hard work behind this wonderful venue. And soon we will see another live music venue in the form of the Corn Exchange, a 500-seat capacity that is soon to be properly open uh, in, in Newport West. I did check before this debate, Mr Deputy Speaker, and the first show is by the band The Bug Club on the 2nd of March. But before <laughs> honourable members go rushing for tickets, I have to say I'm sorry it's sold out. But there will be many more bands and shows performing in the future, and I would encourage all members to look at the event calendar and come and see, see us in Newport West to hear something a little different and enjoy our hospitality. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Barnabas Arts Centre, another independent art gallery run by Janet Martin. And this is another venue I would encourage members to add to their bucket list. Because the transformative nature of art can break out set spaces, and we've seen this in Newport at the Place of Wonder, a, collab a collaboration of 12 artists, also led by Janet Martin, in transforming Rupera Lane from a derelict passage to an astonishing art haven. It would take too long to name all the successes in Wales who have planted their roots in Newport soil, whether the international triumph of Tiny Rebel, the local coffee found at the Rogue Fox, or the small business of the wedding venue in the West Usk Lighthouse. All are rooted in my constituency, and I'm deeply appreciative to be surrounded by such entrepreneurs and to have the chance to represent them in this space. And of course, I cannot miss the opportunity to give a big shout out to the Semiconductor Cluster in South Wales, and of course, Newport Wafer Fab, and all the brilliant workers there who are crying out for certainty, clarity, and a, a coherent strategy from the government. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. the Secretary of State will be able to give us some positive news in his wind-ups today. Yeah. We can live in hope. The last 14 years have been difficult, but I don't want to dwell on them today, so I will say to all the teachers, the NHS staff, professionals and volunteers, to carers, transport workers, council officers, and everyone who lives, learns and works in Newport, Western Wales, thank you for all you do to make our nation in this country what it is today. Yeah. But I cannot leave this speech without mentioning steel. Steel produced, recycled, repurposed in, in Wales is as Welsh as it gets, mm -hmm. from Port Talbot to Llanwyrn and Sims Metal and Island Steel in Newport West. We all want a transition to green steel production, but it must be a just transition. 
We need to utilise a blend of technologies because decarbonisation must not mean deindustrialisation. And as we mark St David's Day 2024, we have the chance to champion all the great and good that makes Wales what it is today. To appreciate what we have in Wales and acknowledge that we could have so much more. And we are not far from having the chance to deliver that change with a change of government here in Westminster. The people of Wales need it and they deserve it too. And the sooner the better. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to start by echoing the thanks to the Right Honourable Member for Proselli Pembrokeshire on uh, securing the debate and obviously the Backbench Business uh, Committee for uh, granting that debate. Uh, I would like to focus on a small number of key issues uh, today that are facing the communities that I represent, where I believe that this government could be uh, doing more, and in some cases, a lot more uh, to help. The first issue I wish to raise is the once great post office, uh, the foundation of strong community spirit, which is something we in Wales are hugely proud of. In recent memory, almost every city, town and village had local post offices, once called the, the front office for government. Local sub-postmasters and sub-postmistresses knew their customers and could offer a wide range of government, financial and postal services. Post offices were once the hub of every community, a trusted British service that was once the envy of the world. They were indeed the fabric of our communities. Sadly, this is now a thing of the past. We are all familiar with the truly appalling way in which the post office has treated its own loyal staff in the Horizon scandal. But the culture at Post Office Limited seems to be ingrained. Post Office managers are turning their back on our communities and secretly closing post offices without any public consultation. This is an all too familiar pattern where a sub postmaster or postmistress retires or resigns. Post Office bosses initially claim the closure is temporary. They promise to update elected representatives in 12 months if the branch is still closed. A whole year where vital services uh, vital services close residents through necessity make alternative arrangements. Post office managers then claim it's simply not viable to reopen the branch as there's no customer base. Is there any wonder if a branch has been closed for a whole year? The post office has pulled this trick in Merthyr Tidville. Five years ago, Tree Harris post office closed when the sub postmaster left. No replacement has been provided. Just last week, the sub postmaster in Panscatalog resigned, and the post office, who initially said this would be a temporary closure, were forced to admit that they had no plans to recruit. Post offices closed almost are permanent, and zero consultation with communities who use them. This arrogance from the post office really cannot continue. Yeah, yeah. Government must change the rules so that if a sub postmaster or sub postmistress leaves, and there are no plans to recruit, the Post Office Limited must consult with residents and elected representatives. That is the very basic that our communities deserve. I also want to talk about uh, the cost of petrol and diesel, which continues to be a major issue for people right across the country. Motorists filling up their car in Merthyr Tidville and Mumney are paying considerably more than areas just a few miles away, often as much as 10p per litre more. I've been campaigning on the impact this petrol pump rip-off is having on residents in Merthyr Tidville and Mumley, and I've asked retailers to explain why prices are so much higher. None have been able to provide any reasonable justification. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm afraid that to many of my constituents, uh, it looks like price gorging, and I agree. Yeah, yeah. I've encouraged motorists to use apps such as petrolprices.com, but with prices remaining comparable in the local area, there is little scope to shop around. In Northern Ireland, the Consumer Council published a fuel price checker in September 2020, which has helped to keep fuel costs below those in Wales and England. People are continuing to suffer because of the Conservatives' cost of living crisis, and the Government, I believe, must do more to act. There is genuine competition and to end petrol pump rip-off in Merthyr Tidville and Rumney. The last uh, area I'd like to focus on, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the, the, the pension credit. As we know, the, the Tory cost of living crisis has hit pensioners particularly hard. It should shame the Government to its very core that almost one million pensioner households across the UK are estimated to be missing out on vital support from pension credit. A staggering £2.1 billion of pension credit is left unclaimed. Just think what that £2.1 billion could do with pensioners who are struggling to pay their bills. Working with the Citizens Advice Bureau in both Merthyr Tidville and Caerphilly, I organised a pension credit day of action where, in a single day, we helped people claim over £200,000 in missing benefits. 
Just imagine what the government could do if they really wanted to. Mr Speaker, ministers must do better at getting cash out of the Treasury and into pensioners' pockets. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'd like to end uh, by taking the opportunity to wish you a very happy St David's Day. Did Gwil Derry Happis uh, to you and all those celebrating tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Richard Thompson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I say what a pleasure it is to speak uh, once again in this uh, annual, uh, if sadly truncated, uh, debate on St David's Day. And uh, can I also congratulate the Right Honourable Member for Presley Pembrokeshire and once more putting in the legwork to make sure that we have the opportunity to have such a wide-ranging and good-natured debate on, uh, on, on, on matters Welsh. Um, I was not intending mentioning the rugby, mostly out of <laughs> politeness, but, um, <laughs> but the Honourable Member for Gower uh, raised it uh, in the three straight defeats. Um, I have to say, you know, from a Scottish perspective, we gave you every chance in the second half, <laughs> but, but uh, anyway, I, I perhaps I'd per- Perhaps I'd better just move on from, from, from there. And just to say that uh, the SNP does indeed wish everyone uh, in this House and beyond a, a very happy St David's Day when it uh, comes. It's always a, a good opportunity to, to look back at history, but also to look forward. And uh, in terms of, of looking forward, there's no issue of greater import, I would argue, to young generations than uh, the climate and the energy transition and the economy and the need to get all of those parts working together, as the the Honourable Member for Kiernan Valley said so powerfully earlier in her own contribution. Now, the Honourable Member for Differ Merionith also said about uh, the the role that the the Crown Estate and what it does has to play in that, because I can speak from the perspective of Scotland, where the Crown Estate has devolved, and the Scottish Government has used that to forge ahead in terms of granting licences for over 25 gigawatts of offshore wind development, which puts us at at the forefront in many respects of offshore wind development globally. That's double the UK's existing offshore capacity. It will create high quality jobs and draw in significant investment. So having that power devolved has clearly been a huge benefit in, uh, in, in Scotland. And as the member for Kiernan Valley said, uh, it is, I hope I'm not putting words in her mouth. She didn't quite say this, but I hope I'm not putting words in her mouth. That it is beyond time that uh, Wales was able to directly benefit from its own resources instead of only being able to catch a little bit on the way past as those resources were exported. Now, that's something that the the Treasury bench sometimes gets quite excited about uh, whenever uh, it's brought up in the Chamber, but in light of the the failure of the the wind auctions, as the Honourable Member for Lynethley uh, pointed out, you you can see why. And I think this is an area where the the UK Government is in danger of being on the wrong side of Welsh opinion, because YouGov conducted a poll which found that 58% of people in Wales supported devolving the Crown Estate to Wales. And it's also uh, come out as a recommendation of the Independent Commission on the Constitutional Future of Wales, alongside other matters such as the devolution of justice and the devolution of railways and a fair funding settlement to go along with them. Now, another telling headline, at least from my perspective, from that uh, report by the Independent Commission was the willingness of that cross-party body to say that independence for Wales was a viable option for Wales's constitutional future. Now, that might bring mixed reactions, but I would say, from my perspective as a supporter of Scottish independence, that actually being able to get a group like that to agree on that point is actually a pretty positive place to be. Uh, it's probably because you know, it shows that the respect that there has to be between the different positions on the constitutional positions. Because too often in Scotland, attempts are made to shut down a debate around independence so that it's in some way too difficult or even <coughs> plausibly unviable. Because the question isn't or shouldn't be about could this happen, it should always be about should. And I think that that's a good place for a respectful debate to take place. And with support for independence regularly now polling around about 30% in Wales and apparent majority support in the under 34 year olds, it's a, a discussion that is going to. The, the, uh, uh, it's a discussion that will have to uh, that will find itself in the public domain to a greater extent in the years ahead. Uh, about polling at 30%, I've never seen a poll which is anywhere closer than about 20%. I'm not about to open up my phone to go and look at the exact polls, but I would be more than happy to meet with them after the debate and show them and uh, apologise if I'm wrong or share a, or claim a pint if I'm correct. Uh, yes. 
Um, on the point about the in, uh, Independent Commission, which I think is a landmark moment, um, does the Honourable Gentleman agree with me that it was really important that the Commission didn't pick any of those three options? It said very strongly that it was up to the people of Wales to actually decide. Would the Honourable Gentleman agree that that is the right way forward? <coughs> I would absolutely agree with that point. It's enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement for Northern Ireland, the principle of consent, which is implicit that it's for a decision for the people. I would argue that's a position we, are, we ought to be in in Scotland. It's a decision for the people, and of course it's a decision for the people of Wales, how the former government best suited to their needs, and to then bring whatever pressures they can through the ballot box to, to bring that about. But there were two other uh, recommendations came out of the... Uh, of the, the, the Commission, which uh, struck my eyes, which was that uh, the, the need to secure a duty of cooperation and parity of esteem between the governments of the UK and about how the Sewell Convention ought to be strengthened. Now, that's something which a Labour government in Cardiff and an SNP-led government in Edinburgh, I think, could probably find a lot of agreement in. Now, my party, I have to say, is often happier to find ourselves in agreement with the Labour Party than the Labour Party is often happy to find itself when it finds itself in a, agreement with the SNP. But there are examples which creep up where the Scottish Labour Party appears to be um, at variance with their colleagues in Wales. And I'd like to use my remaining time to highlight one example. And that is that when the UK government finds its record under attack, it points the finger, not always fairly, I would say, at the record of the Labour government in Wales. And in turn, that Labour government in Cardiff points the finger back about the funding settlement that is in place uh, being imposed by the UK government. Yet when Labour in Scotland tries to criticise the Scottish government, it seems completely oblivious in a way that their Welsh counterparts aren't to the funding structures that are also placed in Scotland. So I don't know if Welsh Labour ever speaks to Scottish Labour. If you haven't swiped right on each other yet, I'd be more than happy to affect the introductions, but uh, I'd be very happy to set up a blind date um, if that would be helpful to do. But I would just like to draw my remarks to a close, Mr Deputy Speaker, by... Can I very briefly intervene on him? Yes. I, I, I'm sure you'll join me in wondering the fact that nobody um, could, would, would come forward to recommend the status quo, and the Commission didn't so, so do so, because there are evidently no advantages to the status quo in the present devolution settlement. Time is short, and I think the Honourable Member makes her point very, very deftly, as always. But I would come back to the point made by the Honourable, right Honourable Member for Presley Pembrokeshire about the proposed expansion of the, uh, the, the, the Senate and the electoral system that is there. I have to say that having multi-member constituencies is not a new thing. They exist in Northern Ireland, they exist in Scotland for the regional list, they exist in local government here. And yes, of course, elected representatives treat people without fear and without favour and without regard to who anyone voted for or even if they voted at all. Yes, really, um, and certainly that's how any elected representative worth their salt would go about. But Conservatives, at least as I always used to understand it, used to be in favour of consumer choice. And it does mean that voters do have a bit an element of consumer choice to, in terms of who they wish to take their concerns to, or if, indeed if they wish to engage the services of more than one member. So uh, there are examples which I would be more than happy to discuss with later, because it really is not the end of the world as he is uh, portraying it to be. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it's good to see you in the chair again for this annual debate. Um, I also thank the Chair of the Welsh Affairs Select Committee for securing the debate, and, and I gently echo his sentiments about the time that we have for this debate today. Thank you to the Backbench Business Committee for granting it, and to all colleagues present for um, their contributions to what is always a wide-ranging debate on Welsh affairs. I'm going to just mention a few contributions. Uh, my honourable friend for Gower, who talked about rugby and cockles. Um, the, my honourable, the honourable member for Llanetli, who, who gave a great speech about rail infrastructure, renewable energy, offshore wind delays and steel. Um, the formidable member for Swansea East and her Everyone Deserves a Campaign. And I think, Mr Deputy Speaker, if she asks you to help, you don't say no. Um, <laughs> My friend, the member for Canon Valley, who talked about our proud industrial past. My friend, the uh, member for Newport West, who talked about music and culture in her constituency. And I'm very much looking forward to visiting the Corn Exchange this weekend. And to my friend, the member for Merthyr Tydfil and Rumney, who talked about two very important issues, post office closures, which I entirely recognise from the experience of my constituents in Cardiff Central, 
and the poor rollout by the government of pension credit. St David's Day is a time to celebrate Welsh heritage and national identity, and we on this side of the House, the Labour Party, are fiercely proud of our Welsh heritage and that it was a Labour government that delivered devolution to Wales. And ever since devolution, Labour-led Welsh governments have delivered positive change for the people of Wales. Free prescriptions, free school lunches for all primary school children, the highest number of nurses and consultants in the Welsh NHS for a decade, protection of the NHS bursary, unlike in England, a ban on fracking, unlike in England, and those are just a few. Labour is the party of devolution. We are committed to reinforcing the status of the Senate. I think the Honourable Lady has had several um, contributions, so if she doesn't mind, I'll carry on. We are committed to reinforcing the status of the Senate, strengthening intergovernmental working and pushing power out of Westminster and into the hands of our communities. Mr Deputy Speaker, Wales is brimming with potential. Yesterday, pupils from my constituency from St Philip Evans Primary in Llanedin came to Parliament and I met them and their teachers at the end of the day here. They were fascinated by what they'd seen and they gave me quite an enthusiastic grilling with excellent questions. But they, like all children from across Wales who are able to visit Parliament's wonderful education centre here, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank all the staff there for the tremendous job that they do, those children are our future and we all have a responsibility to make sure that they have the good future full of the opportunities that they deserve and i am ambitious for a future fueled by the talent and innovation i have seen up and down wales i am proud of our roots in industry industry has been our history and it can be our future too but the chaos and failure of the government risks squandering that future. It has been rightly raised a number of times today by my honourable friends that the issue of steel. Steel making is the lifeblood of communities across Wales, the backbone of our local economies and the foundation of our manufacturing capability. And that is why the deep cuts to jobs that have been mooted at Port Albert's are a kick in the teeth. But instead of having a proper industrial strategy like Labour, Conservative ministers have compounded the risk to livelihoods. Forking out £500 million in taxpayers' money to see up to 3,000 people made redundant and forfeiting our ability to make virgin steel. The Business Secretary not known for dis diplomacy, I might add, <laughs> said that Wales should consider this a win. And the Welsh Secretary has said that it's mission accomplished on saving Welsh steelmaking. And I'm afraid that this attitude shows casual indifference to the thousands of people across Wales who have so much at stake here. And it shows a fundamental misunderstanding of our Welsh economy and a total disregard for the need to preserve the UK's sovereign steelmaking capability. Because however Conservative ministers try to spin it, the loss of sovereign steelmaking is a fundamental threat to our UK economy and security. And he can chunter as much as he wants, but that is the truth of it. Because however Tory ministers try to spin it, that is the truth. The floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea that we heard about this afternoon, and the new nuclear power plant at Wilver, that the Right Honourable Lady has been begging for year after year, that we on this side of the House want to see, will all need significant quantities of steel. So where's it going to come from? And in an increasingly uncertain world, this government is surrendering our sovereign capability to build the Royal Navy ships we need to keep our shores safe and our shipbuilding industry strong. Now, the Secretary of State has said on numerous occasions that no one will be left behind. And he talks about his role as chair of the transition board, a monument to his party's failure to secure the future of sovereign steelmaking in Wales. So I want to put a marker down today, Mr Deputy Speaker, here and now. If these job losses go ahead, I will be holding him to account every single step of the way. 
because, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have seen this happen before. I grew up just a few miles from Shot and Steelworks, which in 1980, under a Tory government, became scarred by its closure. The resulting loss of 6,500 jobs remains the biggest industrial redundancy on a single day in Western Europe. It totally decimated the area. Nearly everyone at my school had family who worked in the steelworks or in the supply chain. And the impact of those mass redundancies in our area was felt for years and years. All those skills and the potential of my generation wasted, the rug pulled from under our feet. And I am deeply concerned that we'll see this again, this time in Port Albert and right across our steel communities. But it's not just steel. On nuclear at Wilver, on Newport Wafer Fab, the jewel in the crown of our high-tech South Wales cluster, this government drags its feet, while workers and their families nervously wait, jobs and investment go, and opportunity withers. Mr Deputy Speaker, Labour has a different view of how things could be, and we have set out our plan. A UK Labour government would invest £2.5 billion in the UK steel industry by the end of its first term, and that is on top of the government's earmarked £500 million. We will increase domestic demand for steel by more than doubling onshore wind capacity, tripling solar power and quadrupling offshore wind. And we will get Britain building again. And Mr Deputy Speaker, a general election is coming, an opportunity for voters to make their voices heard. And my pitch to them after 14 years of Conservative government is this. If people feel it's no longer true that when you work hard, you get on. And if people are bored and frustrated with watching a chaotic failed government more focused on holding its party together than on governing, if people feel like it's time for a change, look to Labour. We can build the economy of the future, create good quality jobs, drive down energy bills and provide energy security. And we in Wales will play a critical role in powering the whole of the UK through a decade of national renewal, rekindling Wales' proud industrial roots with the industries of the future. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you very much indeed for allowing me to have a few things to say on, uh, on this St David's Day debate. And I thank the Right Honourable uh, Member, the Chairman of the Welsh Affairs Select Committee, for bringing this debate forward. Let me turn, please, straight away to the, uh, to the comments made by the Right Honourable Lady. First of all, on what has actually been delivered by the Welsh Labour Government in Wales. The Honourable Lady, with all due respect, left a few things out. She didn't want to mention the fact that the Welsh Labour Government have delivered the longest waiting lists in the whole of the United Kingdom. She didn't want to mention the fact that the Welsh Labour Government are now having to build air filters to blow away the diesel fumes from the ambulances that wait for 9, 10, 11 or 12 hours at a time outside Welsh hospitals. She didn't want to mention the fact that the Welsh Labour Government, after 20 years, more than 20 years of devolution, have delivered the lowest educational standards in the whole of the United Kingdom, and that is from the OECD. She didn't want to mention the fact that the uh, 20 mile an hour limit is causing extra congestion in Wales. She didn't want to mention the fact that the Welsh Labour Government are, dis are damaging the economy by bringing a ban on any new roads being built. And she I certainly will, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I, can I correct him? And uh, he keeps repeating this ban on, ro on all ro road building, which he knows isn't correct. And on 20 mile an hour, if honourable members opposite want to complain about 20 mile an hour zones, they might want to look at their own trans transport department, which promotes them, Tory-run councils, which have introduced them. He himself wanted 20 mile an hour in his own constituency. And the organisers of the anti-20 mile an hour social media groups in Wales, they're run by a Conservative councillor from Sunderland, who, wait for it, has supported the measure in his own patch. You couldn't make it up. Speaker, I, like all members of Parliament, have supported 20 mile an hour limits outside schools or hospitals or other places where there are vulnerable people. What I've never done and what the Conservative 
opposition haven't done is to support a blanket 20 mile an hour speed limit. What I would never support, Mr. Speaker, is a suggestion of bringing back seven bridge tolls, which was put forward by a Labour council in Monmouthshire. It's in their own leaflet. What I would never do, Mr. Speaker, is bring forward a tax on the tourism industry, which is going to destroy more jobs in one of the most important industries in Wales. And what I certainly wouldn't do, Mr. Speaker, is to tell farmers that they're going to have to put aside 20% of their land for planting trees and for other wildlife schemes dreamed up by people, Mr Speaker, who obviously don't know what the countryside is all about. What I wouldn't be doing, Mr Speaker, is spending over £100 million on about the only job creation scheme the Senate have ever come up with, which is going to be effective, and that's to create dozens of extra Senate members. And uh, given that the Honourable Lady and various others, including the member for Gordon and I think one or two more, mentioned the Independent Commission, which frankly wasn't that independent, the Commission itself expressed grave reservations about the voting system, the closed list voting system, which is being brought forward by the uh, Labour Senate Government without any proper uh, discussion with the public upon whom it is going to be visited. Now, the Honourable Lady went, wanted to talk about steel, so I would suggest to her that she ought to stop giving false hope to steel workers in Port Talbot or suggesting, or suggesting that this has come about as a result of a decision by the Government. The Honourable Lady made a, a few comments which were simply factually incorrect, and I think uh, uh, I might need to educate her a little bit about how steel is produced. <laughs> the first thing is, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that there is no sovereign capability to make steel in a blast furnace because every single, uh, every single bit of iron ore which is brought in is brought in from abroad, as is all of the coke, not least because the Honourable Lady's party wanted to shut down all coal mines because of the concerns about the climate emergency. There is no possibility of virgin steel making because all of the ingredients are coming in from abroad. Second thing is, as far as I'm aware, none of that steel is currently being used by the Royal Navy, but there is steel being produced for the Royal Navy in the United Kingdom from Sheffield Forge Masters, and it comes out of an electric arc furnace. Uh, in other points, Mr Speaker, Labour say that they have a plan for steel workers in Port Talbot. Can I tell the Honourable Lady that I actually visited Mumbai and I've spoken to the, head of, the global head of Tata uh, about two weeks ago and also the head of Tata Steel, and they made it very clear to me that no such plan was put to them by the shadow front bench minister. There is no plan that they are looking at. The reason they're shutting down those two blast furnaces is that they are losing over £1 million a day. The only plan that they were going to consider was insolvency and pulling out of steelmaking in the United Kingdom altogether. The plan that the government came up with was not a plan of giving half a billion pounds to fire 3,000 people. The government were presented with a situation where Tata came in with insolvency practitioners and said, we're pulling out of the United Kingdom. And had they done so, it would have cost 8,000 jobs and 12,000 more in the supply chain. And the Conservative government, which I'm proud to be serving, came up with a scheme whereby we put half a billion pounds towards building an art furnace, a scheme which is going to save 5,000 jobs and save a supply chain. And it is absolutely wrong and misleading to suggest that we've given a steel company half a billion pounds to fire 3,000 people when we've given them half a billion pounds to save 5,000 jobs and to ensure that steel continues to be made in Wales. And the danger of what the Honourable Lady is doing is that her words are being seen by Tata uh, across uh, in India. And there will be many people thinking to themselves, do we actually want to continue investing in the United Kingdom if we can't be certain that any uh, deal that we have is going to continue if there is a different government? And her words are also going to be seen by workers in Port Talbot who may be thinking to themselves that there is some secret plan that could save their jobs. There isn't. And if the Honourable Lady does a little bit of research, she will find out very quickly there is no Plan C. There was a Plan A which would have shut the steelworks and cost every job, or a Plan B that saved 5,000 jobs. But the Honourable, Lady, the Honourable Lady didn't mention anything about the £100 million transition fund, because the Government are not going to turn their backs on workers in Port Talbot. The Government have got £100 million set aside to make sure that every single person who loses their job has access to the training they need to get further employment. So the government have saved jobs and are standing by the people of Port Talbot. And I really hope that uh, the Honourable Lady will find out a little bit more about it before trying to, uh, to comment further. I'm also very proud of the work the government has been doing to level up across the rest of Wales. Under this Conservative government, Mr Deputy Speaker, 
We have been responsible for four growth deals. We have been responsible for three rounds of levelling up funding, for two investment zones, for two free ports, including one which is uh, in Port Talbot itself and is going to encourage, encourage more industries to come in, and for the uh, electric art furnace and for the one, the £1 billion project that is going to, um, uh, to electrify the, the North Wales coastline. So, Mr Speaker, we have actually been doing an enormous amount to put money into Wales. Following Brexit, we promised that farmers would not lose out by one single penny as a result of our leaving the European Union. We calculated what agriculture was getting during the last control period. It was around £337 million a year, and we made sure that that money continued to be delivered. It is very disappointing, therefore, that the Welsh Government have decided to take that money and plough it into a scheme which is going to reduce the amount of land that is available for, uh, for growing ag agriculture, increasing feed ma food miles and throw 5,000 people out of work. Yes, Mr Speaker, there will be 5,000 job losses on the Welsh Government's own figures as a result of the agricultural scheme that, uh, that her party's Government are planning to, uh, to bring in. Mr Speaker, can I just uh, mention one, one or two other points uh, whilst I'm here in the last minute or so I've got left? The Honourable Member for Keradigion mentioned um, uh, gigabit connections. I agree with him. We do need a bit of certainty over where those are going to be, and I, I agree that there are challenges in rural areas. But I would just point out that since 20, uh, in 2019, around 11% um, of pro properties had a gigabit connection. That, that has now increased to 69%. So the work is... Uh, going on at pace. The Honourable Member for Merthyr Tydfil made a very good point, as did the Honourable Lady for Swansea uh, East, about cost of living. Uh, I'm not uh, decrying anything the Honourable Lady has done, because she, she does do a lot of good work, but I again just point out that this Government have made sure that pensions, that benefits uh, have all gone up in line with inflation, the living wage has gone up in line with inflation, and there have been extra payments to pensioners, to those on benefits, and to also those in houses with disability. That is not to say that it solves all problems. And uh, the Honourable Member for Merthyr also rightly drew attention to the fact that some companies are perhaps not behaving as they should in terms of petrol prices. Um, and I agree with him. And the, uh, the government are following up the recommendations of the CMA to uh, bring forward extra, uh, a scheme to show to give extra transparency. Mr. Speaker, I think I've only got about six seconds left, unfortunately. Hopefully, a, a little more. Uh, time will be allocated to us next time. Uh, so, can I apologise to anyone who I haven't mentioned, although I'm certainly not going to forget the Honourable Member for Unismon, who continues to champion nuclear. Yeah. I, will, um, I will continue to, to be working with uh, Members of Parliament and, and many others to ensure that the floating offshore wind industry does go ahead. I wish to wish a Dees Goldau Hapis Ichigi Jochen Walgian. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. My thanks to all members who have participated the af this afternoon. I think it has been a very good debate and particularly grateful to fellow members of the Select Committee who joined with me in the application to the Backbench Business Committee. And of course, we thank the Committee for granting this debate. And We do look forward to uh, future St David's Day debates, perhaps longer and more expansive. I was particularly encouraged to hear the speech from the Right Honourable Member for Clonethley highlighting the opportunity for Wales of floating offshore wind. For a nation like Wales, which does not see many new industrial opportunities come along, that is the opportunity that the UK Government and Welsh Government together should be seizing. So we look forward to some good news, hopefully, from the Secretary of State and his colleagues around port funding in Milford Haven and Port Talbot to help uh, capture all of the economic benefits that that new industry could bring to our communities. And uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, again for chairing this St David's Day debate. Deeth Goyal Dowie, happy set. The question is, on the order of favour, may I say aye? Aye. aye. No, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Can I just say before everybody leaves, I've heard very clearly what you've had to say about the time uh, constraints that everybody has had to endure during this debate. And I've chaired a few backbench business uh, debates in the past where, of course, they've all finished early. Yeah. And this clearly, uh, if it had had more time, would have gone um, uh, the distance and people would have had an opportunity to, see, to say way more things. I will raise this with the, the Speaker tomorrow. Uh, also, can I just say that um, I was at St Margaret's yesterday for the memorial service for John Morris, Lord Morris of Aberavon. I have to say it was a wonderful service, but also to hear the London Welsh Male Voice Choir boom out Callum Lan made me incredibly proud to be Welsh. It's been an yeah, honour yeah. and a privilege to chair this debate today. And can I say, Dear Goyle, Dewey Happis, E Paub, 
Have it. Thank you very much. Oh, point of order. That would.